Hello everyone, my name is Kevin, and welcome to The Cosmic Perspective. On today's episode, I speak with my friend Max Fitzpatrick, and we talk about all sorts of stuff. We talk about his experience on Chicago PD with his first speaking role, the auditions that led him to get there. We talk about his relationship with his dad, and how they actually have their own podcast now called The Max and Tony Show. And we also talk about uh, his recent experience in France, which was uh, being on set while his dad uh, is actually in the show Patriot, which is a show that you'll see on Amazon Prime. And we even talk about how we met at Second City and how we later went on to perform together um, for what I think was both of our favorite shows that we ever did live. So all in all, I think this was a really fun one. I really enjoyed having Max on. And I think you guys will too. So without further ado, here's the podcast. All right. Thank you, Max, for uh, coming on the podcast. Dude, of course, man. I've been, I've been, uh, been wanting to be on here for a while now it's uh you know like i've been lying i'd be lying if i was like you know yeah it seemed like a, a cool idea no i was like <laughs> i definitely wanted to be a guest on this for a little bit now man you guys uh well not you guys sorry when i said i just said you guys referring to you and joey but uh, <laughs> like, it, i mean you got a great thing going and I, I like being in this lovely place man you get you you've really spiced it up man Hey, I mean, it's an old building, yeah. but we put some new stuff in it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm glad the mirrors uh, back there hold, you know. Well, people can't see this, but uh, yeah. Joey's a sicko and made a room full of mirrors, <laughs> you know. And uh, it looks great. It looks great, though. And just seeing this setup, man, this setup is so cool. Thanks, man. I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, so uh, this this is Max and... Uh, the. He's got his own podcast, actually. Yeah, I do, and it's and it's with his dad. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about like you know what what's that podcast like? What do you guys like to talk about? You know, give him an idea. Yeah, what of the course, theme man. Is. Uh, so the podcast is called the Max and Tony Show, and uh, you know, my dad was actually maybe I should start with my dad for a little bit. He's a, he's mm -hmm. a famous artist. I, I I tend to say locally famous, but his art's kind of reached a point where it's getting kind of nationwide. You know, everyone's seeing it from he usually does good in new york he does good in new orleans he doesn't do good in la but uh or san francisco so there's something about california where he just he has not it's not the market had his best uh he's had really good shows there but uh yeah i mean in terms of sales just not yet we'll just say not yet but um he actually made a living uh being on the radio and the uh, you know, I, I don't exactly know how he got on the radio, but he was on The Loop, if you know, 97.9. It's still there. And he reviewed movies with Buzz Kilman, a guy who uh, he's been a, he's a radio personality. He's a big uh, actually he just had a big article about him being a kettlebell guru. He's like 70 years old and he's like lifting these kettlebells like nobody's business. What? And I just saw a picture of him dude, this guy is jacked, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they used to review movies. Like one of their first movies was like predator mm -hmm. and shit. And, uh, wait, can I swear on this? You can say okay. whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Once that slipped out of my mouth, I was like, Oh man. Okay. But no, uh, yeah. So in shit. And, uh, uh, so no, but, um, like I had to hear all of these stories about how they used to review these movies and just, like they give like the highest praise to like the worst B movie. And then they'd rip up like something like Rudy. Like <laughs> oh, my teacher uh, found out, like I wrote a paper and I said, uh, Tony Fitzpatrick is this. And she goes, do you know Tony Fitzpatrick? And I go, yeah, he's my dad. And she goes, Oh my God, your dad had the funniest review about Rudy. He <laughs> ripped up Rudy. You don't rip up Rudy, but he ripped it up. It was just like one of those things. And I heard like just countless little stories here and there. And like I, I got like nostalgic and like a little envious that I didn't get to like live through that time when my dad was on like the radio, you know, weekly just talking about stuff. And, you know, this podcast revolution has come into full force and i sort of pitched the idea hey we should do a podcast man and he was like yeah he goes but uh you know i i don't know if i could do it with buzz man buzz is really still into the radio thing i go dude uh i was kind of was kind of talking about doing it with 
you know, me. With me. <laughs> <laughs> goes, like, I just, I just yeah. want you to do it with me, Dad. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. So he goes, oh, oh, yeah, may, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. What, what do we, what would we have to do? And, um, well, I was like, well, we could just like Google what to do. So I Googled like, hey, what's like the essentials of getting this podcast started? And it was just, you know, mics, mic holders, and just, you know that thing <laughs> the, and, interface. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the interface yeah. yeah and then just like a good program to have it like i was going to use garage band and stuff and we were actually i think we had gotten uh like all of the equipment like all of it i'm pretty sure and then this guy named chris bat uh heard what we were doing and he was like you know i have a recording studio and if you guys want to record you know the first five or ten episodes you know we can make that happen you know i think it's this is a good opportunity to get my recording studio attention which is uh park walk productions on 1822 west grand you're perfect, welcome Chris. perfect plug <laughs> yeah perfect plug but no um if but if anyone has any like uh things they would like to record uh they should give this guy a call or at least consider him he's a great guy but um he produces our podcast and after the first you know five i i think it kind of evolved into this idea that we wanted to do more than just 10 you know i, I think our s second episode was our first guest which was a andy davis and he directed the fugitive and under siege with steven seagal he's actually the guy who made steven seagal kind of what he is today <laughs> a piece of shit unfortunately <laughs> uh, no no I, I, no that was all steven's doing but, i know uh, yeah I'm kidding. you know no no but you know he uh he's he's the guy who sort of found him and uh be, you know he's yeah yeah. I, I won't I won't I won't I won't touch on Stephen Seagal. Yeah, much yeah. More. I mean hey, what but, Stephen Seagal uh, does in his personal life yeah. has nothing to do with the opportunity he was given for the movie. Oh, he looks <laughs> yeah. oh man, and he looks so weird right now. He just looks so weird. But w f fuck Steven Seagal. Uh, <laughs> no, but that but but that was a pretty big guest and we've had some we just had some really good guests on our show. Um you know, we had Steve Conrad. He's I'll I'll get into him a little later. He's mm -hmm. actually the reason I was in Paris, which I'm sure we will talk yeah. about later. Yeah, I listened to that one. But yeah, um yeah, he's um brilliant guy. Uh then we talked to a bunch of like different actors and uh next week we actually have this famous country singer named Steve Earl that's gonna be uh talking or we already recorded it, but um it's gonna be come out uh next Friday. And uh, it's just we've gotten some interesting people. We want more viewership or, you know, you know, like everyone does. It's like <laughs> you can have a million views and you still want more because we're all really selfish people. But uh, ego driven. No. Yeah. But um, I mean, it's been a blast, man. I mean, there's nothing like even, you know, talking to you. I mean, there's nothing better than just like letting everything go. It's very therapeutic. It's very honest and reflecting and. You know, it's just, it, it's well needed, man. It, it helps you become a better person. I, I mean, I feel like I've become uh, at least at least an okay person over this time, you know? But, hey, yeah, I don't know. It, uh, it, dude, it makes you think. It yeah, really makes you think because really does. you hear yourself talking, and you're like, how do I sound? Shit, I sound like this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A robot weasel? Fuck. No, not me. Fuck, I need yeah. to do that one differently next time. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I yeah. definitely and feel it, that. <laughs> it, it distracts you from your likes and ums, which I'm sure I've already dropped a thousand times right now, but, you know, it's... That, I mean, it's you, part of it's yeah. part of just saying things off the you top. Have to get you over know? it. I was about to say, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's it's been fun. It's it, you know, we we want more out of it, obviously, but you know, it with more comes with you know more time, more work. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna put that in. So we'll see. Stay tuned. You know, the Max and Tony show. We're Hell on yeah. SoundCloud. We're on Apple. I'm going to do another plug. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's a good time. There's nothing really better than doing it with your dad as well. I mean, I know a lot of people don't get to say they had like, uh, you know, a good father figure or good or good parents in general. And like, I, I mean, I think the theme of my life is I'm a very lucky person. I think I used to joke around with one of my really good friends that I was like the luckiest kid in the world and now I'm like the luckiest 
grown kid in the world. Like I really like, yeah, my whole life has been really uh, luck based and I'm Irish. So a, a lot of that makes sense. And I wasn't born into religion. My dad went to mm-hmm. like a lot of Catholic schooling. So, you know, it, I mean, he, he was not the greatest student. He was very mis, you know, misbehaved and, uh, you know, it, he got punished for that. And he took that as a really, really negative way, uh, uh, you know, to view, um, you know, this, this religion that's, you know, doing you, you know, he was just telling this story, uh, you know, he's, this father's about to beat him up and he actually, he actually told it on the, uh, the pot, the podcast, uh, this, this, re- the most recent episode, but he said this, uh, father's about to beat his ass cause he did something. And he goes, what, what about mercy? You know what the Lord praises all this. And he goes, that's for the Lord. He goes, I'm in the justice department. And just, <laughs> it's like, it's stories like that, that make me realize, oh, that's why I don't go to church every Sunday. And, you know, I, I think that, so I don't have any of this like weird thing, like, you know, oh, God has put me in this position. I really, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, I used to be a really full blown atheist, but now I'm an agnostic. So I, you know, j- just because certain things happen in your life that make you question, oh, that yeah, was a little weird, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, I don't think like God put me here. I think I was just like, I, I got a really good lotto ticket and uh, I just want to take advantage of it as much as possible. So yeah. Hell yeah. 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 I, I actually want to go into that a little bit more. Sure. Yeah. Um. So what made you go from like a pretty hardcore atheist to what you would now consider agnostic? Would you consider yourself like agnostic atheist or? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, you know, there's just a lot of stuff we just don't see and, and, mm-hmm. you know, we just don't know. And I think, you know, there's, there's been a lot of lucky situations. Um, and just, I, I, I guess there was an eerie event. My dad actually just going back to him, he had uh, heart surgery uh, a few years back and it, uh, well, one, the, the, the incident that led him to getting the heart surgery almost killed him. And then he almost died in the surgery or post surgery or something. I think he had an infection, but it was like one of those things that's just like, it just scares you to death, man. But my grandma just said this really eerie thing to my dad my dad's just kind of looking at her and my grandma just passed actually but she was looking at you know rest rest in peace grandma but um but she she was just giving them this look like tony i made a deal with god that i was gonna go first and it was kind of like this thing that sort of moved the room and it was like one of those things that make you go whoa it was not like she was telling him it was like she was like telling him and God, like, I'm not going to have my son go before me. And I mean, it, it, the situations that uh, came into play, like, um, you know, my dad had this infection post-surgery. There, My mom had this really good friend whose husband was, you know, that was his exact field of surgery, like post-infections. And he, like, oh, wow. got over to the hospital and he knew he had some suggestions on what to do on how to help it and i mean sure enough my dad came through we're doing a podcast now and it's like one of the biggest blessings ever and there was just that one incident that really made me think man and it there's, was and, you and think it, there's something else yeah there's yeah, something it, i'm missing yeah and there's a lot of i mean you see it a lot of time like i i once got the privilege of like hearing uh jesse jackson uh talk once at, 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 and this wasn't so fortunate but it was at my friend's funeral uh rest in peace quinn kyles but he was like he said something like man he, he goes he goes he lived a short life but most people have lived longer and meaningless lives and i'm totally butchering what he's saying but he just i mean everything he said was just moving the room like it was like a wave and i that's when i started to think i go okay if there is someone in the sky determining what our lives are going to be, I don't really believe that, but I believe there's things you just can't see. Like there's certain, there's an energy, man, you know, there's, (laughs) there's a certain, there's a certain, there's stuff in the air we can't see. There's stuff that's like, you know, whether it's just chemicals or, you know, just chemistry. And like, I feel like, I don't know. I've always believed in this thing where like there's extra stuff, 
floating around it, whether it be like an aura or whatever that shit, you know, I don't, I don't know the science of it or like, and I don't know enough about energy and, and uh, <laughs> like, like uh, what, what's that shit with the crystals and the, you know, the, oh, yeah. all the, the yoga, you know, I, and I love yoga, but, but I just, you know, I believe that's all there. I, I just don't know much about it to kind of be an expert on it. But I, I, I mean, it's just weird, man. I feel like if there's stuff floating around you and me, for example, like all the stuff that belongs to us, our energy, our chemicals or whatever, they're bonding right now. They're like, you know, and if we were uncomfortable with each other, they'd probably be like blocked off. Yeah. But, yeah. Or like resisting, you know, like, yeah, for example, being on like the CTA train and you're like, oh, man, like, uh, do I sit next to this guy? I think there's outside forces kind of like it, both like kind of like this little what is it kinetic energy is that the right word to say i don't know what the hell it is but it's just like they're just like kind of like e e stat like it's like shocking us cuz we don't we we just don't socially know what to do and then there's people who are just totally like i'm sure unaware of that stuff and they just like they just do their thing and that's cool i don't know but i think there's like some outside forces out there i don't know if it's god i don't know if it's um you know jesus but <laughs> but yeah it, it, you know yeah there's there's definitely an extra layer to reality that i think most people are not necessarily tapping into yeah and um the ones who might be tapping into it might be tapping into it because of religion but it's not necessarily that their interpretation is the reason why they're tapping into yeah. it as much as the belief in a higher thing suddenly makes you more aware of those little synchronous synchronicity like situations that you run into yeah. or the different moments where something happens at the right time with the right person mm -hmm. in the right moment. And yeah, those are the things that I think certainly made me go from an atheist to an agnostic. Cause I had a very similar, okay. I had a similar story, not, not of like a, you know, the similar catalyst for, for change per se uh, of like a, you know, a moving moment like that. But uh, for me, it was my experience with psychedelics that kind of made me realize, oh, there's sure. an extra layer here that I'm yeah. not that I was not keen in on at all. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I kind of agree. I did. I did. Um, I did have experience with those, and yeah, you, you, when you see those like colors not fully kind of coming together, and they're reflecting off someone's skin pigment, and they're just going like crazy, and then one minute you're looking at someone's hair. And it's just not fully blonde anymore. It's actually greenish. And you're like, what the fuck? And you realize it's like, yeah, that's that like that's that stuff is living. It's and I did, you just don't recognize it because your eye doesn't slow from what I understood. It doesn't slow down enough. And like those things help, you know, your eyes slow down and see those little extra things. I haven't gone that deep into that stuff, but from what I have, it's pretty cool, <laughs> but I, but yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to like, if my parents are listening to this or my uh, family is listening, I don't want to, I don't want to like freak them out or whatever, but like, I, like I've literally oh, it's too done late for me on that a few, <laughs> a few times. Yeah. 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 But, um, it's, you know, yeah, it's, it's fun, man, but it's, yeah. But I, I, know, I also know some people who just went crazy off of that stuff. So it, it's definitely like this, like very influential, uh, <laughs> um <laughs> and uh this this it's, an it's a very influential world i'll say and it's also i don't want to say maybe it is addictive right i mean if you once you see that stuff you kind of want to see it again so so here's here's my take on that okay I, sure i think it's um a it's definitely a, a dangerous substance meaning you know whether it's like lsd psilocybin mushrooms um, ayahuasca it's dangerous in the sense that if you are unable to grip yourself back to the collective uh, objective reality and I yeah. say that in yeah. quotes uh, if you're not able to reintegrate yourself back into that world afterwards that you can find yourself becoming more and more disconnected with the reality that like it or not we're all playing in yeah right and I find that although the substances themselves are not actually addicting um, the state of refresh, the mental reset that you get can yes. be, right? You yes. can chase that. And that's kind of like the chase in the dragon type thing. Sure, you know? yeah, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and I think that some people, um, 
miss out on the insights that you get are then supposed to be applied. Yeah. And so I find that integration is like 90% of the psychedelic experience if you want to get the most out of it. Wow. But, but the truth is what you want to get out of the experience is entirely up to you. Yeah. So this some is hitting me be... so hard, man. Sorry to, <laughs> sorry to interrupt, but it was it, like, I, I remember this one kid was like, nah, I don't, I, man, I'm never doing acid again, man. He goes, it's fun, but he goes, it makes you an outcast, man. It makes you an outcast. He goes, you just see all this extra stuff that nobody else knows about. He goes, and nobody cares for the most part if they don't do it. It's like, I do not want to be an outcast. And I was just kind of thinking about that. I go, he's kind of right because it's like, you know, it's hard to, I mean, yeah, we all have to go back to reality. We all have to go mm-hmm. back to work, you know, yep. <laughs> yeah. but it's, yeah, it's hard to it have like a so trip much and then you just go straight back to do, to do that when you just saw a bunch of crazy stuff. And also, you know, it's you do you do contain a little more knowledge after you do it. I remember kind of not doing it for a while, or like I was nineteen and my friends were starting to get into that. And I mean, I eventually did, but I remember before that I was like, these guys have kind of have these like pompous attitudes after they did it now, and they just think they're above everybody. But truthfully, I mean, you see stuff that other people don't see, and you start to think you know certain thoughts that you always had in your head but they're finally unlocked and you're kind of just like wow i've never thought of it in this way before and <laughs> but uh do lsd kids anyway, um no but no no let's you know, uh, fully full don't, disclaimer don't, here no. uh don't do it unless you're like 21 and you know oh, when, yeah, you, when you're course, when you're a full course. adult and i for me i didn't do it until i was 21 and I think like taking that time to live life up until then, yeah. been in college for a few years, mm-hmm. uh, that when I was when I was able to have that experience, I was like ready for it. Yeah. And that, like you said, I had a bunch of ideas in my head that I already like, I already knew. But then certain things just like it's like the final click where everything just kind of clicked for yeah. me. Yeah. Um, and since then, it it's kind of profoundly affected how I approach my day to day. Does it at times make me feel a little disconnected with the average person? Sure. It, yeah, totally. it definitely does. Do I think some people get really elitist afterwards? Yeah, I try not to. I try not to be like that. I, I find that I try I'm not more to empathetic. Either, like, I think I'm, I've been cool about it. Yeah, I I'm feel not, like I'm, I'm more not understanding. Too, I mean, I, I I'm not too into it. You know, it's like I, I enjoy talking about it. Like this, this is an awesome. Like conversation we're having. Uh, but I, you know, it's like I'm. I knew a guy who like any opportunity like like whether it was a music festival or like whether the setting was right he's just always like dropped that idea and it's just like man i just don't think of it like that it's just like if it's really like something people really really wanted to do in this case when we were all in amsterdam on a trip it was like the majority of people wanted to do it i was like okay yeah let's let's do truffles like whatever like that sounds (laughs) fun and then we you know i and the first time i ever did that uh did acid i was i was 19 and uh it no i was wow i was 18 oops sorry uh <laughs> but um no 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 but we you know we we were all going to an art museum and it was like we were all in california a bunch of chicago kids for the first time in their lives it's like it, you know it's it's more i look at it for you know the the opportunity when everyone wants to do it cuz it's like if it's just you and your buddy joe who wants to do it it's like uh, man, I don't, I don't know, man. Like, are we going to like, can I trust you? You know, it's like, it's a little more trusting when everyone wants is everyone buys in, you know, it's, it's definitely easier if you're going to do it with uh, another person that somebody that you're like actually close yeah. with. Yeah. yeah. Cause you're going to, you can't hide who you are in that state yeah. of mind at yeah. all. So you're going to be a hundred percent you and you got to hope that that person's okay with a hundred percent you. Yeah. That's why I'm so glad, like, we agreed that, you know, before we took this acid, you know, just now, um, <laughs> that we just are so into the 100% of it. No. No, we did not do that. We did not take it. Um, all right. So that, that's enough about that. I don't want to talk too much about um, psychedelics there. <laughs> Freaking psychedelics. I, I enjoy talking about them, yeah. but uh, no, no, there yeah. are a couple things I do want to talk to you about that are totally not related. So this is going to segue just kind of whatever. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, sure, man. So. Something that you had done, which is really cool, is you were on Chicago PD, yeah, <laughs> and you actually had some lines. Yeah, you were, you were quite had, the character. I had eight lines. Yeah. Oh wow. I mean, if I don't think I'd want a, you know, um, 
I don't think you want anything else in your first role, man. I mean, a stoner security guard that that gets <laughs> killed. I mean, in a Dick Wolf production, what what's better than that? I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, again, this is back to like the whole lucky kid. I mean, I, I was I was born with a dad who had had like he had an art career. He had the radio thing, and then he all like, dude, this guy's got a horseshoe up his ass. Like, I got. I'm pretty sure I only got half the horseshoe, you know, but he's got the full horseshoe like up there. He's an actor or, and it's because he met this director who actually just passed uh, Jonathan Demi. He's he directed Silence of the Lambs. The one I think is like one of the only horror movies that actually won best picture, dude. And it's just like but before that, in the 80s, he needed an album cover for uh, his one of his first movies with Jeff Daniels. And was it Melanie Griffin or something? Griffin? There's some, I don't know. I, I, I think that's her. Um, sorry if I got that wrong. But she, they needed an album cover. And I think my dad had just done an album cover for this New Orleans group called the Neville Brothers. He did Yellow Moon. And that was actually, that album cover is the whole reason Like he's he's he is who he is. I mean, that album cover put him on. And then Jonathan Demme needed an album he needed an album cover for something wild. That was what the movie was called. And he did the album cover and I, he didn't do the front. He did like the back where the credits are, but it's like, it's, it's still one of the coolest things. It was hanging in my grandma's house for years, uh, before she actually passed. But, um, you know, yeah, but then he got to be in this movie. Jonathan did, uh, called married to the mob. And my dad played like some immigration, officer he got like two lines and once you get a line in a movie or tv man you get your sag card and you get sag benefits and stuff and after that he was like always doing part-time little move you know little like roles there like he uh is usually he jokes around we always joke it's like he's usually the security guard the cop the racist (laughs) <laughs> the racist security guard, the racist cop is just like, or the bartender, the racist bartender. It's like, you know, typecasting is very real. And the people who kind of break out of that, that's like a gift. So, I mean, he's always prided those roles, you know, just because somebody's got to do them, you know, somebody's got to be, you know, the, um, you know, the, the crazy biker or something, <laughs> which I, I he recently played like some, they always just get him as these like totally typecast guys but um fortunately he um has been able to uh parlay that into a better role which uh, we, I again will probably that's down the line here I, I guess but it's called Patriot and it's on Amazon so he's kind of like finding this acting career almost to be his like full-time career soon so hopefully hopefully soon i mean i don't know he loves art he That's gets awesome. really sad when he doesn't draw and uh but i mean that i mean he's becoming a better actor man and these people are taking notice so it's it's cool but with that you know um i always wanted i was like hey man i go i i kind of am getting into this acting thing i really think that like um if you could ever like introduce me to your agency goes, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And it was always like just this kind of open ended, like, yeah, you know, we'll do it. And then, you know, second city came along and I finally got an opportunity to show this dude that I can like perform, I guess. And, you know, I, I, um, I, I've never been like, shy you know but uh well you know that's such a lie why did i say that i've been totally shy i've been so fucking uh cowardly shy i don't even know why i just said i've never been shy i've been totally (laughs) shy but i think um no and actually wait i don't i don't even know why i said i've never been shy uh don't edit that out because i like correcting myself but (laughs) what i'm what i'm saying is you know I never had the guts to go on stage even though i never felt weird you know talking to people or you know being up on you know in front of the class or anything so then I just remember like man I just hope I don't suck I just hope I don't suck before every show I think the first show we ever did was like a level c show you know or 
I could like I I bet we can dig that. Vi I know there's a video up on YouTube there. I bet we can <laughs> dig that up and see how nervous I was. But I remember by the second show, I was so afraid of being nervous. You kind of turn all that energy into kind of fu energy, and you're like, okay, no, I'm not going to be embarrassed. The crowd's going to be embarrassed, and I don't know. I've always took that and just wanted to run with it, and just wanted to look as stupid as possible on stage but st just get a laugh just get a laugh honestly and fortunately my dad saw me a few times in that second city run and then after the last show which i believe was either the level d show or or no level e what's the last level e level yeah, e. Okay. yep i haven't been there in so fucking long i'm sorry second i city. saw that show yeah 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 that's <laughs> right that's right okay so i think it was that show just for the sake of uh making a really good podcast it was that show yeah. um, where we where we met uh right no, no my that dad was, was that like, was where we met which yeah, is, yeah yeah uh where my dad uh after the show he was he said something like uh, you know, I think it's time to introduce you to uh Bob and Donna who are my who are now my agents and it's like it's like whoa and you go into the the agency which is uh Grossman and Jack and you know you're just kind of like I don't know you you're just sitting there and they're telling you yeah you know yeah you could be the guy who like burned down the liquor store and then you're like oh my god <laughs> my typecast I yeah, can <laughs> I'm getting typecast and now yes and they're like yeah the stoner the guy who the JD kid the this and I was just so happy I was like really you think I could like you think I fit this look <laughs> and I'm like definitely you shady bastard <laughs> no, but um but uh no it was just it was just one of those moments where you're like wow this could be really cool this could be potentially cool and then um you know, I got an audition. It was like a general audition just to see what you're all about. It was for uh, Claire Simon uh, casting, and she casts um, Chicago PD. Uh, I believe Chicago Fire as well. I don't think they do med, but um, maybe, I'm, I, maybe I'm totally wrong on that. But uh, I did that, and then I got a call from Bob, and he was like, hey, man, you know, um, yeah, they really liked that audition. Uh, just stay tuned. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Wow, wow, they liked it. And then you're just kind of like, okay, cool, they liked it. And then um, I took um, I t I had an audition for Chicago Med. That was my first like real audition, and man, dude, that was a nightmare. That was so awful. It was like, so I'm in the like room you know reading my lines and then my buddy is helping me kind of go over the lines and we stopped it in the middle of it and he just goes dude i don't think you should audition for this <laughs> what <laughs> and i won't go over like what the role entailed or anything but like it was because i don't know i don't know how far i'm supposed to describe that but <laughs> i was like what do you mean he goes i mean you know it's like I mean, what is this really? <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> um, my life. <laughs> yeah. My, and he's just like, yeah, man, I, I don't know, man. He goes, I, I, I just don't think this role is for you. And like you, hearing that now, I can accept that. But hearing that like in the moment, I was like, fuck that, dude. No, it's no, we don't know that and all that. But, you know, it really I mean, I didn't get the part. I I, I was so bad at the audition. Uh because I was just so overwhelmed by like what like I, I was I was running late at, but I got there on time but I kept I was calling people and being like I'm gonna run late I'm gonna be late but I was there on time so then I looked like you kind of look dumb like when you're like I'm gonna be late and then you get there it's like I'm not late <laughs> <laughs> okay but uh, yeah, I didn't get that one and then um you know uh, and then like I get, like that audition and then I uh, and then three days later, I auditioned for the conservatory, Second City. I thought I had a pretty good audition. And I was like, dude, I think I got it. I think I got it. F four days later, got an email saying I didn't get it. And I was like, oh. So it was like two bad auditions. I was also at the Annoyance Theater. And I'm just getting my ass kicked, dude. I was not funny. <laughs> I was not, like, I'm. you're surrounded by this pool full of really really talented individuals and some are just so undeniably funny and then I kind of I kind of gotten humbled there I was like you know I think that I like 
people laugh at me. Like I'm the straight guy who gets laughed at, you know, like what's a good example for like, it, this just popped in my head, but Ross, like David Schwimmer from friends, like mm-hmm. l- very great to laugh at. He's not, he's not Joey cracking the jokes. He's yeah. fucking hilarious. It's like Ross, he's the straight guy. He's just awesome to laugh at. And he takes his role with pride. I think that's kind of what I learned about myself is like, yeah, I could be, I could kind of make people laugh on purpose, but I know people laugh at me when I'm in a vulnerable position and I'm just like, no, I, I never did that. I never said that. No, or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing right now, but uh, <laughs> you know, um, that was like, but like, it was just kind of like this down period for me where I was just like, oh, dude, uh, what am I doing? It was like, I got my dad to get me this agent. I'm not like, I'm just like, if I had two auditions and it's like, I don't know if I'm good. I don't know. And then finally, like in the midst of this like downer, whatever I want to think of this period of my life, I got the, Hey, you have an audition, uh, for PD. And, uh, it's for a stoner security guard named Luke Ivy. I was like, Holy shit. And I just like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to attend. I went over the lines, man. And dude, I, you know, I was looking at my dad. I was like, I, I was like, I want this one. I was like, this is like, something that would be really cool to just say this was my first role and it's mm-hmm. like i don't if anyone knows me dude i i am a stoner <laughs> i'm just not a security <laughs> guard you know it's like so it's like please like give the stoner the stoner role you know and um so i go in the audition room man and there's like three guys i sit down and i just look at around the room and like one looks fo- just so fucking nervous. He's just like looking at a wall and then he hasn't oh, looked shit. at anyone. One guy is just like, I nod at him. He nods at me back with a smile. And then the other guy's looking at me like this. And he's just goes like, oh, and he just starts laughing. And I'm like, I can't tell if he's laughing because like he thinks that like this guy or something, <laughs> or he's like, this guy is perfect i couldn't tell what kind of laugh it was but it was like it didn't seem like mean or anything it seemed like he was like oh this guy's good that's a good look or something (laughs) so i was just like okay cool just and i was like i think the last one in there was was the really nice guy who nodded back at me and that was it but i was like the second to last guy in there and i thought the audition went okay you know i didn't think it went you know the best or anything but i I was so confused. I was just like, I, I, you know, it didn't go bad, but it didn't, you know, it wasn't my, it was it wasn't my greatest time reading those lines. I thought I had a better time with it. And I was telling my friend and he was just like, yeah, well, we'll see. And then I, okay. So then like, uh, within like three hours of that day, I got a call and they were like, yeah, so you're in the running for the role. I was like, okay, next day, not a word. And I'm like, Oh, lost it. Okay. Fuck. I was like, and then my mom was like, you know what? Like, you know, you were probably the, the, the runner up. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were like, but that's, this is three in a row. Yeah. That's cool. I just keep taking L's. Yeah. I guess, yeah. I guess I'm quitting. I took my third L mom. Okay. <laughs> and she was just kind of like, look, like that's a good thing. You got your face out there. You know, uh, we did it at Claire Simon. Claire, she's like, they're going to know who you are, you know, coming in and out the door. I was like, okay, cool. And then the next day, uh, next morning I got a call and, uh, they were like, yeah, you got it. I was like, what? I was like, uh, no, what? Yeah. Cool. 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 (laughs) Yeah. Let's, uh, okay. And it was just one of those feelings, man, where like, you know, I, you know, I didn't, I never got into like a good college you know because it was a really horrible high school student i never you know i I, columbia college is a great college but i mean it's so you don't have to do anything to get in there you just apply and that's not to insult maybe it's different now in days but i mean that just and it's not to insult anything but that's really just what you do you just apply and you get in and i wanted to go there because they had a great film program but like, I mean, you know, I wanted high school. I wanted to go to like USC, UCLA, mm-hmm. all of this to the point where like I went to Santa Monica College in order to transfer to all these schools. And then, you know, I hated that school so much to the point where I was like, you know, 
I'm not going to get into these schools. It sucks to tell yourself that. It sucks to do that. But it was the truth. And it's kind of, you know, it was something I just had to swallow. And I was like, I want to go back to Chicago, make short films in Chicago, and then explore whatever I can in this movie thing. And I did that. And then after that came Second City because I was just like, I just want to keep exploring this acting because that was in the end of it. But it's like I never got to do the whole like thing. I never got accepted that was like my first accept like acceptance to me. Like it was like, oh my god, I got I got in or like I, can, I, I got I in. I got this. the part, and it was just like one of those things. It was like a triumph, and I'm not saying it totally makes up for, you know, me not going to some weird prestigious film school in California. But I mean, it definitely, it's one of those moments. You just, it's a feel good ass moment, and then you know, and then to actually be on the set and to, you know act with uh the the guys who are on the show who's uh patrick fluger and Leroyce hawkins they're really nice dudes and uh you know there's nothing better than you know after doing the scene and them just being like good shit man and like it's just like tapping you on the back and just being like good shit it's like whether they meant it or not you know <laughs> it seemed pretty sincere and it's just like one of those feel good like things where you're like man it's like Yes, yes. And it's like something you just don't forget. And like, I just kept telling myself, like, just sink this all in and like, don't think that this is going to be like, oh, now it's time to move to LA, you know, because there's so much more work to be done, man. There's so much more. But like, in terms of getting your first role, I mean, hell of a start, man. Like, that's what I kept kept telling myself. I was like, but no, there's more work to be done. And there's a lot to learn. And actually, I actually learned that there was so much more to learn when I went to Paris and watched my dad act and shit. But uh, yeah, I we, we can go into that, or unless you want to talk about, if you have any questions about the the PD thing, I don't I don't know. Oh well, I mean, just a couple things of. of it seems to me like that role was the moment where you felt like, all right, good, I am on the right path. It's that, yeah. that, that little bit of reassurance that you needed to be like, okay, I'm not wasting my time. Yes, that was that was definitely that was definitely something. That was definitely something I felt. It's man, it's just it's just good because I before all of that I had put in so much work on acting and acting is so weird to work on because it's like how you're like, playing pretend. You're with yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're you're playing with yourself. <laughs> and, and Congratulations, you just played yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no. For real though, it's you know, you know, like you literally your tool is your own mirror. emotions. Yeah, yeah. Or um, you know, you can interact with people at a bar, and you know, you can make a joke, and or you can. I, I've never done this, but I guess people pretend to be completely different people in certain settings and see I've totally it, never done this yeah see <laughs> see if it works yeah, yeah, yeah. oh okay I've done uh, it a friend a friend of mine I just pull off a mask <laughs> it's not me uh no 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 but you know it's it, your, your tools I mean I think the highest technology of a tool is like if you wanted to film yourself on camera right but like mm-hmm. or but you're reading monologues you're like trying to memorize stuff i was playing memorization baby games just to like strengthen my memory because i was like dude my short-term memory is kind of shot because of all the the pot no (laughs) but it's it's sad no and i've been i've been so i've been so much better about that that i i my dad often jokes around he's like yeah freaking this guy's baked or whatever but it's like dude I have made such strides, and it sounds so pathetic because it's like it's just weird. But it's like you've made, I've made such strides to like keep that at the most minimum point of my life. Like, like I, I don't, I don't see the need to to quit if it's like if you're gonna smoke at night just to go to sleep. It's like that's not gonna like mess that's not with that's your not ruining your life. Functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exa- if, yeah. If it's not stopping you from doing the activities that you're trying to do, then there's nothing wrong with like yeah. burning a little yeah. bit, especially because it's much less harmful on your body than most other drugs that people are in. Oh, you mean like all the alcohol I all drank alcohol. last night? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah was, that, that'll that was certainly fuck you up worse. <laughs> yeah. No. And it, it, honestly, it'll. It's amazing if you are really hungover, for example. 
and you could just take a toot of that and your stomach and your appetite will come back like crazy. Yep. Um, and then you eat some food and we, it absorbs the alcohol yeah. and you feel a little bit better. Yeah, exactly. But it's, you know, um, I don't, man, sorry. I'm, I'm forgetting why we, why we got to this part where, where I'm like, well, I kept it at such a minimum. Oh, but it's just, you know, it's like speaking of short term memory. Yeah, loss. <laughs> Jesus. It's shot. It is just shot. Oh, cause I'm taking these, me- cause I was doing these little memorization little things to just to help. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's crazy, man. I will meet someone and I'll repeat their name, do all of that, and I'll be like, "Holy shit! I just forgot their name in ten seconds, man!" Damn. And it's like, yeah, it's bad. It's have, bad. Have you ever heard of Lion's Mane? No. What is that? Okay. So th- this might actually help you. This is yeah, this please, is my I'll, prescription I'll do anything. for you. Uh, so Lion's Mane is a mushroom. Not a psychoactive. <laughs> one. It's, not, it's, it's not. It's not psilocybin, guys. Yeah. Uh, so lion's mane's a mushroom, and the reason why it's called lion's mane is because the way that the fibers like flow out, they literally look like a lion's mane. Yeah. Um, and basically, it's a nootropic, and a nootropic. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I for, take for, for I take alpha brain. Yeah, there you go. My my buddy listens to Joe Rogan all the time, and he was like, "Yo, I'm thinking about getting this stuff called alpha brain," and I was mm-hmm. like. Yeah, cool. I'll try that because <laughs> like, yeah. it sounds. It just is like Why he's not? like he broke it down like Joe Rogan would break because I heard him breaking it down too. I was like, yeah, this sounds like worth trying, man. It doesn't seem like it's gonna kill you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I I've we split a bottle and then like I went and ordered my own, dude. I oh, like hell it. yeah, I like it. It's good for working out too. Hell yeah, yeah. But, but lion's mane, it, it's it's a nootropic that uh, it's not like you take it and you feel it. It's not like caffeine. So it's actually more of a supplement. Okay. So basically, you would take it. You take it daily, and after about four weeks or so, mm-hmm. um, that's when you'll start seeing the effects of improving your cognitive function, your memory. Wow. It promotes neurogenesis, so growth of your neurons in your brain. And uh, when you combine that with niacin, which is um, <laughs> vitamin. B12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when you combine those two together, it actually really helps with your with your memory. And so speaking of Joe Rogan, yeah. um, what convinced me, I'd already heard of Lion's Mane before. I'd heard on like Tim Ferriss's podcast. He always advertised it. Um, but what convinced me of actually taking it was Paul Stamets, uh, who's a mycologist. So this dude's a okay. fungi expert. Wait, and is this the guy who was recently on his show? He was recently he, on Joe he's Rogan. A, he's like a shroom guy, yep. and he got rid of his stutter through yes. shrooms. Yep. Yeah, that yep. was a good one. Yep. That was a really that good was, one. That was one of my favorite episodes, and he talks about Lion's Mane. There's, you can find I'll, I'll probably link in the description of this podcast. But um, it, it's it's like a 10-minute maybe little section of that podcast cool. where he talks specifically cool. about Lion's Mane. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think – I think I've heard. I think I heard him talk about it then, and I just like I probably just did my short term memory is just not good. But no, um, but try it. It's not horrible. I've been been taking it. It's not great. I've been taking lines, man. I like so in the morning. um, I'll I'll take it as like part of my regiment. So whether whether I'm like having a protein shake or on a day where you know because lately I've been working mornings, so I haven't really been able to like work out in the morning. But otherwise, I'll just mix it in my pre workout and I just chug that shit. How much does it suck to work? at night or after work it's just not Dude, ideal man I the worked, best is to start your morning with it i worked I in a bar and uh i was working till you know 2 a.m 3 a.m yeah it's fucking awful i'm a morning person so i just can't even do that like yeah. i don't mind working early in the morning it's fine like, yeah i'm no, already no, gonna be up no and it, there's something about getting out early that like it's you it's, know it starts the nights day. ahead of you too so yeah it's weird and then you're kind of you're kind of on top of things. Once you're out, you're, you're talkative and like, you know, there's some people who are like, like they didn't work that day. So mm-hmm. they're just like off. But like, I always found myself when I was coming up, like out from work or something, talking was just like the best part. It's like, cause you had stuff to talk about, you know, you were like, so just ready to be away from this place that just holds you down. It, it makes you work. I mean, that's your, freaking job or whatever but it's just like you know you, you you're just so relieved to be out of that situation that it's just like anything's better than that yeah but the, i think the last thing you want to do is fucking work out it's like yeah we just want to pump some weights it's like no i want to i want to go to a bar yeah yeah uh, I, I definitely prefer working out in the morning that's yeah, the man. Uh, yeah because it's it's just a catalyst for the rest of the day it sets you in a good mood you release some endorphins yes. you feel good it's also it's an exercise of uh, persistence and it's an exercise of pushing through pain 
right? So yeah, like w- when you're when you're doing something, whether it's weightlifting or cardio, mm-hmm. every time that you push yourself and you literally are fighting your own brain, like your body can keep going. Your yeah. body can honestly keep going a lot further than you think it can. I know, and, and I need your to mind like tells push you to quit. Myself. Yeah, yeah, I need to push myself more. I, I've noticed that. I do quit at certain certain opportunities, and I think I do. I, I mean, I think I work out okay, but I, I forget it is really pushing those boundaries and those limits. And I'm starting to realize that though. And, and I think, think about that's it. Good. Every time that you push those limits in exercise, that makes you more likely and more able to push those limits in other things that you're doing. You're so right. You know, oh, it's, wow. it's a feedback loop. So if you're able to push it there, then you try you then you try pushing it in something like writing or in acting. Yeah. And you'll you'll tap in just a little bit further because you've trained your brain to be like, I know that I have another level beyond this. You just taught me something, man. That was really that was really great. That save like archive archive that <laughs> Arch- archive that that well, was i i feel like sports, that was really good sports taught that for me yeah uh, of yeah. that i had to keep pushing it and you know when i first when i first started football i've talked about this on the podcast before but when i first started football you know like i was kind of written off by a lot of people because they well, knew, what position were you man i was a running back and a linebacker nice yeah nice. This is good run- i mean you either want to be the, uh, the quarterback <laughs> the running back or the linebacker, right? I mean, like, the, especially the first two I just named. But, yeah, I mean, I felt like every person in football that had, like, a like a good place, like, on the team were those positions, right? Yeah, I mean, those are fun. And you're, yeah. like, you know, linebacker uh, usually is one of the leaders on the defense. Yeah. So, you know, whoever, maybe it's the middle linebacker or it could be somebody who's on the on the edges. Did you um, play, So you played both. Yeah, so in my first year, I was a running back and a linebacker. In my second year, I was honestly more of a running back. They really didn't play me in defense that much. Okay. And then in my third year, dude, I was I was a I was a blocking back, so I was in the backfield, but I, you know, and occasionally I'd run some routes, but they never threw to me. No. <laughs> and they didn't hand me the ball too much. Uh, but then on on defense, like then I was uh, I think I was a DN that year. Okay. Um I think it was just because at the time like I, I'm not like a super big dude, but at the time, like I was definitely bigger sure, than, yeah. the, you know, we were kids, it was fucking yeah. middle school. So no one was that big. No, you, no, no. And then the most overweight people would be the linemen. So I, I wasn't like overweight, like a lineman or anything. So they would put me at like D end and that way I had okay. some speed and I could, you know, sack. Yeah. And, like, I'm not, I'm not a hundred. Yeah. I, I, I know. I think I, I'm pretty sure I know what position you're talking about. Or yeah, put, it's it, the it's the ones on. So they're on the line, but they're yeah. out in the edges, and they're so the ones who would try to like you know crash they come in for the and, quarterback, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I I mean I don't know, I know as much about football as as any the average, average yeah. Joe I would say, but yeah, the the, the positions. I know quarterback, running back. <laughs> <laughs> I know linebacker to a degree, and yeah, yeah, I know like, and I know a lot of names. I know, mm-hmm. I know, but um. It teaches you yeah. discipline, man. Football is, uh, although I would never let my kids play it because I think it's fucked up my body. Um, sure. I think, I think in general though, the things that you learn in that sport mm-hmm. more than even like I play baseball too, more than even in baseball, it just taught me so much more about like toughness and grit. Yeah. And I think that gave me that, that thing that allows me to push myself beyond what yeah. I otherwise would probably, I mentally want to quit, but then I just, I just know in my heart, I'm like, I know I can't quit here. Yeah. I know I can do more. And Screenwriting so teacher it. actually said something similar. Uh, Danny Kravitz, uh, cool, really cool dude. Um, if you ever like find an opportunity uh, to take a class from him, that's not at Columbia college. I don't know if he teaches anywhere else, please take him. He, said something like he used to be he used to run so it's like mm-hmm. you really push your limits while running i mean oh, you yeah. have to have these extreme conditioning you know drills before you even go out and have an event i don't even know anything about running events or, or like marathons or any of that because i just i run a mile <laughs> <laughs> that's it man and i feel such i feel like such a a tool sometimes but at the same time you know i've been trying to I've been trying to just like run that mile and then just and then just get that over with and just say I can run like a mile a day and I think that's that's cool. So next time you run your mile, go for a mile a and a mile quarter and a half or a mile and a quarter. Yeah, start small, man. Set, yeah. set yourself up for success. Yeah, because 
I mean, I don't, I don't know about like your stick itiveness but you seem like a hardworking person. Um, but I'm all right. I could be better. But, but, but if yeah. you set, but if you set yourself up for failure, like, oh, I'm going to run two miles, and after like a mile and a quarter, which you, if you set that as the goal, you'd be yeah. happy with, uh, and then you quit. You know, if you're setting it for two miles and you're not even getting close to it, it's just going to disappoint you, and then you're, you're less right. likely to try it again. Yeah. Well, the yeah, the teacher was saying like he goes, you know, he goes. I equate this to like when, you know, I'm reading my screenwriting, I go, this sucks. And he goes, and it brings me back to when I was like running or, um, you know, doing whatever sport. I mean, it really applies to all sports and you go, I suck. But it's that moment when you say you suck that you realize that and you know that you have to get better. You know that you're going to have to push yourself and you know that you're going to have to take a new route to do that. I mean, I, I don't know. I think I guess those moments for me were when I got those two lousy auditions. Well, actually, my Second City audition was not lousy. <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah, let's let's. I want to know what was up with that. Anyway, no, but, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, but like those right two in a letter situations, <laughs> they like make they're like you're like oh my god, I have to get better. But I do recall after the conservatory rejection, I did go to the annoyance where I was getting my fucking ass kicked and i actually had a pretty good day and i was like yeah i go this is like this is like what you it's the realization you know it's like you need to be funnier you need to be sharper yeah i mean hey it's, every it's every crazy. little step in the right direction is affirmation that you're doing the right thing and yeah. it doesn't you don't have to reach your milestone in a day you don't have to get to the finish line at the very beginning of the race you know it's going to take time i need to hear that dude i really <laughs> need to hear that i that oh man i i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna call you every day now and just, be like, <laughs> just just say something man just say that was very that was very uh wow i really needed to hear that dude <laughs> hell yeah but, um yeah, I think well, it's because we need reinforcement. Let's yeah. let's let's be real about it. I mean, the truth is, is that if you're doing everything in a vacuum and you're never getting any reassurance or anything from anyone or even just the activities themselves, then what is your motivation to keep doing it? There's not going to be motivation. You need to get something back. So for me, I look for little things that I can get back along the way to a larger goal. So I have a large goal. I know where I want to be in a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. but I know that in order for me to get there, I got to create a ton of small goals that I can like check off the list. Yes. So I use a planner and I, I literally write my activities in for the day that mm -hmm. I want to achieve. And as long as I am checking things off the list, then I feel satisfied about the day. And if I don't check anything off the list on a day, then I circle it. And I put it on the next day. And I wow. will keep circling this shit until eventually I cross this motherfucker off. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. it takes a while. So certain activities I notice I'm neglecting because I'm like, fuck, I circled that for like five days in a row. Clearly I'm not I don't want to do it. Yeah. That's why I need to do it now. That's so funny. I had a I remember making this to do list. Uh it was probably like my freshman year of uh college and of Columbia College. And I was just like yeah, I want to. I want to get my license. I want to get the. It was just basically all these like things of what I needed to do to be re a responsible human being, and I was a little behind. I I still think I run behind a certain, you know, certain standards. Like I didn't get my license till I was twenty four, you know. And granted, the CTA takes you everywhere, so. I mean, there was no reason for me to really have it, but I mean, all my friends had licenses. You know, it's I, I, there's a lot of things. I, I I've said it before here. I, I I'm a grown ass kid. <laughs> Kanye West made that up, but it's like a very it's like a very great term. It's like I I still don't. Yes, I'm a man. I'm a grown man or whatever. But it, like sometimes I like I look back and I'm like am i though <laughs> I'm, I'm still a child yeah and i just you know yeah. hold on to that so man. all hold those goals that though, all those yeah but all those goals i i made i mean they didn't they all came they were all accomplished at one point but it all scattered over a five-year period but it got done and it was just like one of those things where i told myself i go you set these goals they will eventually get done. Just don't, yeah, just, like, keep circling it. Like you said, like, keep keep it on the mind. And, like, there was times where I was like, I'm never going to get my license. And I held it off. And maybe I just wasn't thinking about it. But it was still always fresh on my mind, you know. It, it stresses just, you out. Yeah. When you neglect things, I mean, you, you 
whether you're thinking about them consciously or not, it's it weighs on you. Yeah. And yeah. so your neglect ends up hurting you more in the long run when you don't address those things yeah. that you need to take care of. You're so you are so right. I gotta go to the hospital and get a checkup soon. <laughs> <laughs> no. But yeah, um, man. Yeah. I think I think the moments like that really uh, recently pushed me to to be better w- w- was when I was in, in Paris and I was watching my dad work and I got the opportunity to watch. Uh, well, the guy who wrote the show Patriot, which is on Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, please check it out. I think you've got to get past that pilot. The pilot's long and it there's a lot to take in the pilot i think people lose their patience for it like just if i had any criticism about the show i think people like tend to be like oh this is so long or whatever and like they'll tune out and then therefore when they get to the second episode they're like what's going on it's like (laughs) you tuned out of the first one but every episode also gets better not to like and not to pull this like little ploy to lure people in watching (laughs) the whole season but it really does and um they're doing the second season in Paris, and my dad was there for three months. I fortunately got to go the whole month of January with him and watch uh, him act uh, with some known people. I mean, Kurtwood Smith is in it. He played Red Foreman on that '70s show, and he's in, he's the villain in RoboCop, and uh, <laughs> he's a really nice guy. Uh, Terry O'Quinn's in the show. I know Joey has met Terry O'Quinn actually because he was telling me because I, when I was talking to him about the show, he goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, I met uh, one of the guys who's in that." Terry O'Quinn was like, "You met Terry O'Quinn?" He goes, "Yeah, yeah, coolest guy." I'm like, "What?" <laughs> well, I don't know if it went down exactly like that, but he definitely described him as a cool guy, and he is a very cool dude. He's you know he's very locked in, so you don't get to get many words in with him, but mm-hmm. uh, just a very cool guy. Just like, and he he was one of those guys that like blew me back as an actor. I was like, wow, wow. You're like, there's levels to this shit. Levels, <laughs> levels, man. Like really. Um, and then you know the uh, there's also some young guys in that show. Michael Dorman's the main guy. He plays uh, he's Jack. John Tavner, not Jack, sorry, not Jack. Uh, he plays John Tavner, or it, in the whole first season, he's under this name of uh, John Lakeman. And he's, I mean, he plays this spy who's going into this piping company, and he doesn't know shit about piping, but he has to act like he does because they're going to Luxembourg where he has to drop off a bag of money just from A to B. But, of course, how these shows start, it doesn't go to B. Or, of or, course. Or yeah, it goes yeah. to B and... Did I lose my sound? No, I didn't. No, I did. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, so it goes, you know, it doesn't go to B, but you know, and, and there's this whole goose chase of getting the bag back in the first season, really, and the second season is going to be even better. But another another ploy to get you guys to watch it. Um, but this, no, this so, episode's filled with plugs. Yeah, yeah. But this main guy, I mean, he is the greatest human being I've ever met. He hugs every crew member before he goes home you know, at 3 a.m. to back to his house to wake up at 10 a.m. You know, he hugs every crew member before he gets in that van. He, you know, nonstop had no problems talking to me whenever I, you know, kind of would go up to him and be like, hey, Mike, what's going on? You know, always, always down to talk, always down to just have a good conversation and just an amazing guy. And there's another uh, couple amazing young guys. Michael Chernus, he's an Easy. Uh, have you seen Easy? I have not. He's in the first episode of uh, the first season. He's in the, and he's in another episode. I think it's episode six. And he's also in the second episode of the second season. He's in, some, there's some interesting episodes um, in Easy, but his are quite quite out there i would say especially that second episode of the second season but he's a great guy he came from juilliard and stuff and he's just like this like uh uh just really really great actor um and then my favorite uh not my favorite favorite but like just kind of just like we spent so much time together uh the director's brother uh steve he, or Steve, the director Steve has a brother, Chris Conrad, and he plays this guy in the show who's so hilarious, man. I, you got to check it out. But he's he's a really great guy. We, we hung out with him a lot in the hotel, and man, dude, I I just I I miss that guy, man. I miss that guy. But um, those like all those actors I named, man, they taught me a lot of what it takes to be, you know, 
a great actor and a capable actor. And I will never forget that experience. I know why my dad is becoming a better actor because he's around all of them. And, and I think watching Steve, the director, I mean, I've always wanted to be a director when I was a kid, man. I mean, I grew up on like, maybe it's not timely to say right now, but I loved Quentin Tarantino. I loved, uh, <laughs> No, I, I did Yeah, it's Spike a little controversial Lee. now. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> this is even more untimely. I, Woody Allen, man. I, I mean, like, I, I, I hate to say it, but I, I mean, I grew up on those, on those guys. And no, I don't hate to say that, man. You can it's, separate the. Yeah, the art exactly. From the I, artist. I actually can. I actually. Yeah. I know that's like a controversial thing to say these days, to be like, oh, you can separate the art from the I, artist. I don't know. If, I, I can. I don't know I if really you can, can in like the Bill Cosby sense, but in these, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like because he's sure. a, like when you're doing stand up stand-up is you oh so yeah you can't separate yeah, yeah. that whereas movies at least is like yeah it's them but you know it's also a little bit more abstract and there is a, another sure. story that's separate of them so that's a little bit easier to see yeah but yeah somebody like bill cosby i feel like you can't separate the art uh, yeah from the artist well, the thing about the thing about bill cosby was what, what makes him worse is like like compared to woody allen like woody allen was talking about the stuff he's guilty of, like he's talking about that shit in his movies. If you watch Manhattan, he's going through a similar situation in his life in the movie where, where he goes through it like years later, you know, mm-hmm. and um, he's dating a young girl. I mean, he uh, he clearly talks about this. He was very honest about it. I'm not defending him in any <laughs> sense of the word, but it's like Bill Cosby had this whole bullshit front. Of, of, oh, pull your pants up, and yeah, yeah. meanwhile, I'm drugging and raping women. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just yeah. so stupid. Just so stupid. But, um, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fuck Bill Cosby. But, <laughs> yeah, but, um, no. So, it, it, well, just going back to like these directors, the <laughs> a couple of them controversial, of which I just named, um, <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I've always wanted to be that. I've always wanted to tell a story. I've always wanted to do, you know, uh, that of writing and directing. I wanted to be an artur. I remember I told this old guy that, and I was like, I know it's dead, but I want to bring back artourship. And he's looking at me like I'm a, I'm a kook. And he's like, who says it's dead? And he goes, you can do that. You know, and it's like, okay. But watching Steve Conrad, man, I mean, he's... I came in thinking like he's a really great screenwriter and he's and he's a great director, you know. Um, but I didn't know why, you know. I, it's like you, you don't really know why someone is great, you know. You can Until watch you, his, meet them. you can watch all their movies. You can you know write as many little analytical papers about like why this movie's great, but it's like you have to be on set to understand why these people are the way they are. And Steve is just so obsessive, man. I mean, every time the camera cuts and they're setting up for a new shot, he's like, okay, let me see the dailies. And he's checking out all the footage that he's already shot. And he's like, no, 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 shorten this, uh, cut this, do this. And then if he's not doing that, he's talking about, okay, so tomorrow we have to schedule out uh, um, the, the, the subway scene. Uh, do we have a cart for it do we have this um uh let me see what you have on that location scouting over there are we gonna go there tonight and all that? it's like he is non-stop working and he is so invested in this world he's created for himself which is patriot it was just so inspiring man it was just one of those things where you had to shut up take everything in and everyone was like why you're like hey man are you okay i'm like yeah man i'm fine and they're like okay because like you know, you can sleep in the van if you want. I'm like, dude, I'm not sleeping in the van, bro. I'm <laughs> like, I'm not missing a thing. Like, I want to see all of this. And like, you know, there'd be a lot of comments and like, you're doing this for free. And it's just like, yeah, dude, this is like a free education right now. You know, you don't understand what this means to me. And people didn't really, some people got it. Some people, some people just thought I was totally weird for like bringing myself in like, 12 hour days monday through friday some i went us i went monday through friday and then i they had to do a sunday i went that sunday too and they th- i mean people some people thought i was nuts dude or like even like kind of like just i don't know maybe lonely because it's like it's like don't you have better stuff to do in paris right <laughs> but it, it, it steve actually came up to me at one of the lunches and was like hey man I think you should take the day off you know your dad's not working and uh you should sightsee it was like cool yeah sure but i was like 
I told him, I go, dude, you know, this isn't like breaking concrete or like anything. I go, it's a pleasure to be here, man. And, you know, I, I think, I think he knew I loved being there and stuff, but he also knew that I, I was not seeing the city. So I think he wanted to give yeah, me Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to explore. Give me You're a day in a cool there. Yeah. And I like did, that. I did see a lot of, I mean, I saw so much just driving through getting, getting to a set, getting to a location or being at the location, you know? So that was enough. I mean, sightseeing. I mean, it was, I saw enough sights, you know, it was like, I wanted to be there all the time. I really, I like, there was a point where after my dad was done and they were all going to go to Dunkirk in France, which was so freezing, I guess it's like equivalent to here in terms of, but the wind is really bad over there. And they were like, are you going to Dunkirk? I was like, oh no, I don't, I don't think I'm going, but I was ready to be like, well, you know, Steve, if you want me to go, I'll go. <laughs> but I knew I knew I wasn't going to go. So it's, uh, you know, and plus I I didn't want it's like that costs money and like it's like I'm not trying to, you know, my dad's going to go home and I'm going to be like, "Hey, can I'm going to spend most of my money trying to go to Dunkirk and and you know, probably not most of it, but it's like it would it would have been a money thing too, but also it's like I I'm pretty sure I would have wanted to go home in the middle in the middle of that first week. So yeah. I'm glad I'm happy I you know, my my a better mind prevailed there. But um Hell yeah. But yeah, that I mean that was that was really fun. And uh I love Paris, the city in general. I mean the people there are amazing. I really needed to get out of Chicago at that time. Like, you know, I said I went through that bummer little period of where I was like miffing the auditions and then like, uh, you know, I just I just didn't feel like I was like uh, doing my best work at the annoyance, you know, and I love and by, I've said I've said some weird stuff about the annoyance, I, I think. But I need to clarify that is a great school for improv. And mm-hmm. if you want to be around like the most talented improvisationers what <laughs> no, no. improvisers improvisers yeah <laughs> jesus i'm drawing a blank see my my memory man uh, no, i don't even remember second city no I, do, <laughs> I, I remember it very well but no if you want to be around great improvisers i can't believe i couldn't remember that but <laughs> you should go there i mean you should check it out but how how's second city going for you I graduated, you graduated right? in yeah. December, so I I have not so taken not any classes. Ago. Yeah, I have not taken any classes. You know since. what, man? I didn't either. And then when I, okay, this is the one. Okay, this is one thing I will say about Second City. When I did get rejected, they were like, "Hey, you didn't make it, but take this class and take this class, and it'll improve." I go, "This seems like a money thing, man." And I don't really, I, man. I'm so sorry to say that, but it really did, and it rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah, so, yeah. My last, I mean, my last class, my level E, um, for whatever reason, they decided to add in an express class into our class. Added six more people to make that, it. That's so fucking bullshit. We had too. 17 people total. That's not. That's cool. too many. Yeah. And our teacher was. He wasn't even there for like the first like three classes. Yeah. He missed the first one and had a substitute. Then he was at the second one. Then he missed the third one. And then one of the ones was like a music class. So half the class, he wasn't even the teacher because we had a music person coming. Yeah. So it was like, and then on top of it, for our final show, he decides, uh, yeah, I'm not going to tell you guys what the lineup is or what games you're going to play until the night before. And we never practiced or rehearsed it beforehand. Mm. So we were supposed to somehow get our shit together <clears throat> only in the half an hour to an hour before our show. Right. Like, who's, come on. Who's it's, your it was our, a disaster? Do you, do you want to reveal your instructor's <laughs> name or do you just want to keep it anonymous? Because I, w- I would keep it anonymous. I'll, I'll too, keep it man, anonymous. Yeah. But I, I don't mean, yeah. And, and we'll, talk, e- we'll talk, we'll talk, we'll say yeah. his name after. I'll, after I'll tell this you later. Mic but, is off. And it's not even that he's not, it's not even that he was like a bad dude. He just mm-hmm. clearly didn't give a shit. He no, was like, yeah. oh, I don't care about teaching. I'm trying to get my own acting career off the ground and I don't give a fuck about that. Right. I had a, I had a, I felt like we might have the same teacher. I mean, I had one guy <laughs> that I just did not click with mm-hmm. at all Dude, and the, the teacher we had before was so good so I, to go from that to yeah then the next, that's exactly like, uh, that was the exact which i will say his thing. name matt van colton amazing yeah i'll if say, you get I'll say him my guy's teacher. name level c we had asher perlman and he's just he's just a delight um and he breaks things down so well and just so creatively for people to just get with and everyone he was like 
he's like Phil Jackson. He's very zen and just had this very like everyone bought in. Everyone just bought into what he was saying, and it was just like it was a special time. Um, but then we had this next guy, and it was just like, you know, there was just a couple things. I mean, like I felt like he thought I was this loud, obnoxious type. You know, because at the time I was kind of, you know, like we, I was getting familiar with the group. And when I get familiar with people, I start to kind of get really jokey. And I start (laughs) to like any cheap little joke I can make, I'll do it. Um, And I think I was just a little too comfortable with him. And um, also I was in like kind of a, a, like I was, I was doing a short film and like I kind of came in one day and I was like really tired. I was like, yeah, I just got done doing this short film and uh i just i kind of feel nuts and like he was just giving me this look like oh good for you and i was just like well i don't know maybe i just interpret it wrong but he was just like oh okay <laughs> and it was just, yeah i just uh, i just didn't i i also thought all right i i mean i think second was, city yeah. is a good introduction i thought he was a little creepy I'll tell you, oh, okay. that's, all I'm gonna say. that's all i'm gonna say i mean second city is a good introduction to improv but it only takes you so far and personally for me my goal has never been snl um improv was yeah. it was a creative exercise it was a tool that i could then use for creation of mm-hmm. like writing and generating ideas and it was a way for me to get uh performance in front of people and to get feedback directly in the moment you know if you're funny people laugh and that's what i like about it and i still would like to do improv for fun i i enjoy mm-hmm. it but it's never going to be my career path. I have, I already have my own goals, and and although they're all going to be somewhat related to what improv is about, yeah, it's, I, I'm not, I'm not an improviser. No, in that's terms so of, that's so interesting yeah. that you said that because I I feel like everyone kind of comes in with that idea, like oh, I'm not going to do improv professionally, but then Second City kind of gives you this belief that you can sort of maybe be able to do that Mm -hmm. and they i mean it's a really good feeling so i'm not gonna say like oh i feel uh um like i i was lied to or or i feel tricked or i don't i think you know naturally you trick yourself and yeah you played yourself yeah i played myself for real (laughs) well i don't know what it was i don't know why i wanted the conservatory that bad because i remember being in the beginning levels and being like well maybe i'll audition for it but then once i was graduated and out there was just something so intriguing about it and i'm not saying the conservatory is the end-all be-all of you know uh improv and 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 it's going to determine where you go in that direction you know because i've heard that the annoyance sometimes is just as advanced as the conservatory classes, but you know, it, it, it makes you think like, what if? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, they give you a platform and, yeah. and they give you the ability to have shows yeah. and have regular time and yeah. stage. So, you know, there is definitely some value to the conservatory. Oh yeah. Um, I, I just, I, I still want to know. <laughs> I just think for me, I'm like, I'm just, I got what I needed out of improv, yeah, and I'm down to still perform if I can get some people to come together you know, to yeah. do it. But that that's kind of it for me. Like yeah. right now, I'm more concerned about creating content, you know, making short films. And, I hear and you working on stuff. I I think there's nothing. Well, there was nothing more rewarding during that time in my life than when we actually got to do those shows. And my favorite show, man. I know we've discussed this, but just <laughs> for the sake of saying it. And putting it out here, my favorite show was the show we did with you. And I think we did, what, like two practices? Yeah. Like two little, like, pretty much two practices. Two little run throughs before. before, you know, we we did that. We opened for, like, Twisty. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't know who, I don't even know who Twisty is. Is Twisty, like, a consistent group or no, are they the twist, group of twisty, the month? I think Twisty, like, they constantly cycle people. Okay, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we, well, it's it, it was kind of our biggest show. I mean, it, it was, was it and, was in I terms mean, dude, of we killed actually. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know that was so funny because you know I I was like my mentality because they were like, oh, do you mind Kevin hops on? I'm like, not at all, man. I mean, I don't I, I don't care, man. He wants to be with us. It's like that that's cool, man. And like so when we were doing the run throughs, I was like, yeah, he's, he's funny. My just it's just like. 
I guess the only thing that's left is like, is he gonna show up on stage, man? Is he, yeah. is he gonna or is he gonna like you know be a little nervous? And the, and it's like even if he is nervous, I I mean he's in level you're in level B at the time. I was in level B, yeah. Yeah, I was like I don't have real judgment about that. I mean it's like it's cool that he even wanted to do that. So we did the show and dude, man, you were such like this surprising delight, man. I was like, <laughs> Thank you. wow. It was like the I mean like, man, I'd never really you know in, improv is so you know it's such a mixed bag and it's also you know so many different styles are out there and mm -hmm. i never thought i would have that much fun with your impersonations i was like <laughs> i was like yeah i mean they're gonna be great they're gonna be funny i mean but i was like but well, like is it gonna be like you know? Is he gonna do the the impersonation and like you know? Are we are we gonna be kind of stuck you know? But it yeah. was like no, we all got to work with it. We all got to be like, <laughs> I I remember you did walk in and we were just like, <laughs> I I believe I was trying to get you to confess yeah. <laughs> that you were either related to Christopher Walken or you were Christopher Walken or whatever. But it was just like one of these things. Like we had this really great game going at the time where it was just like bouncing back and forth. And I'm just like this. And, man, I was just really like – I remember thinking it on stage in the middle of my head. Of course, I was like trying to remain in character. But I was like, man, I go, this is fucking – this is a weapon, man. This is fun. <laughs> this is fun, man. And also, I, I came uh, – you know, back the next day to this class, my on camera class at Vagabond School. I'll plug Vagabond. Take take an on camera class at Vagabond. You or and just everyone like who wants to strengthen auditioning because that's actually why I got the role on Chicago PD. I didn't even say that, uh, but my teacher was Michael McCracken, and I'm his, and he's a great teacher. Uh, I highly recommend taking him. Uh, but enough plug, enough plug, <laughs> fucking vagabond. All right, all right, guys, you had your plug. Um, no, but we came in, and the classmate from that class was like, "Hey, I saw you last night." And GC was in the class too with me. Uh, and he goes, "You you saw us?" He goes, "Yeah, I saw both of you. Yeah." She goes, "You guys were kind of better than the than group yeah. you <laughs> opened for." And I know. we were like, "What, dude?" Joey and I we went out to. Um, we went out to the VIG later that night. Yeah. And this this couple like look was looking over at us and was like like they're like giving us this look and I was like Hello? Yeah, how <laughs> cool they, is that? And they were like they're like Were you just performing? They're like so Man, cool. you you guys were really funny. And and we were talking, we're like, Oh yeah, yeah, we were just open for him. He's like, Honestly, yeah, you guys were better than them. <laughs> so, wow. yeah. So w the fact that multiple people from the audience have said to said that to yeah. both of us, uh, that was cool because we I were just, that. we were just a really small little group, just kind of doing a quick little 15 minute. Opening. Was there only four of us? It was, no, I think we had five. It was Nico. Oh, GC, Nico. Was, okay. 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 For you, some reason. Joey, myself. Oh, wait. And, uh, Dan was in there. He wasn't? No, no, I, I not for I, that one. Oh, no, I truly, yeah, he I truly out remember one. he wasn't on that. Yeah, no, he because he, he thought we were going to be super inappropriate. He, oh yeah, I thought we were. He's yeah. not going to hear all, this. I know. <laughs> like, all I all just, of our all of our practices, we we said like the most ridiculous shit. Well, we we, we got kinda, all of that yeah, out. Yeah. We, well, also it was just like we were also sort of. I mean, uh, it's so funny, like. As, as inappropriate as we can come off is like we, we would never really do that live. Oh, yeah, of course. And also, we, we're practicing. Like, we're just trying to stay loose. We're not really like bad people. So it's just <laughs> like I, I've, you know, we were in, and we were in such an era of like, I feel like it's kind of calming down now where it's like, oh, you can't see this, can't see that. But it's mm -hmm. like, how many times are you going to try and like, make rules for comedy when there's no right? rules for making like, people apparently laugh, now man. there's a rule and i don't know if it's like a written rule as much as it's kind of like a unwritten rule that you're not allowed to have any all-male scenes at second city anymore no no all-male scenes because you know that's that's misogynistic and that's oppressing the patriarchy yeah right? I, meanwhile you can have an all-female scene no problem yeah, I, <laughs> like, like, come I on, dude. There's don't value. Don't know what to say to that, right? I, I, There's I, value in all male scenes because well, there are some funny moments that when men get together, they do ridiculous. You're shit. just throwing away the idea that 
men get together. I mean, I mean, because that happens. And I mean, yeah, it's just the same idea as women getting together and talking. Exactly. And, and men getting together. Is, I mean, what does that say to like pieces of work like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, like an all male cast? It's like an excellent play, and it's just it 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 shows like you know it shows how disgusting men can be too it's not like this pro oh aren't men just so great when they're yeah. rich and just so good at their job no it's actually just how disgusting they become when they're under the gun and trying to make a sale and trying to and do anything they become the most disgusting people i think that's so ridiculous I don't know what to say about that, man. That, Dude, that bothers me. No, it, I, it, it bothered me a lot, yeah. too, when I heard that. And yeah. uh, we we need... So don't get me wrong. Respecting other people, important. Of this, course. This overly PC thing, though, is doing the yeah, opposite effect. I, 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 I just... I have a tough time... Like, I, when it comes to politics and, like, lawmaking and, and, and all of that, I'm, I'm so for... I'm so for that, but... Policing the way about, we talk. We're talking though. about comedy, though. We're talking mm. about like making people laugh. It's not like I don't laugh at when someone's like gonna like, oh, you stupid bitch. Like that's not funny. Like, yeah. but if you deliver it a certain way, I mean, who knows? I can fucking laugh. It is like yeah, I don't context. Know, like, context. That is stuff king. is not like yeah. It's so like I don't I don't I don't know how to describe that. It's it's just. It's so ridiculous when you're telling people, oh, don't say that, because it's not funny, in my opinion. <laughs> okay, that's your, hey, your opinion. fucking opinion. <laughs> I don't know. You know, like, I also believe the guys who struggle with, like, a, the inappropriate humor have to shoot themselves in the foot, like, live. Like, they have mm -hmm. to, like, they have to get that, like, like that <gasps> response so yeah. they know, oh, that wasn't funny. That was fucked up. And, like... If you don't go through that trial and error, you're just you're just gonna be dead in the water with these like weird, inappropriate, outdated jokes. Jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess that's it. Um yeah. I don't know. I always thought I'd never really needed to get inappropriate or any of that. I was like you know, I, I always that's, liked it's the low brow like that yeah, that's the yeah. lowest effort. Yeah, version once you, of it. yeah, when you recognize that it's like you wanna you wanna make people laugh because of you. You don't wanna yeah. like the that not because you went for the yeah, low that hanging low fruit. hanging fruit yeah that's the perfect way to put it it's just so yeah it's ridiculous so at the same time i understand i think second city sets these rules because they just don't want those bonehead fucking lame ass jokes i get it <laughs> but at the same time it's like i i personally I don't think, think having I, all males I, is I, gonna i feel like it's more contribute to that i feel like it's more about trying to look like the hero mm -hmm. like yeah, oh but yeah, i'm yeah. i'm on team righteous oh and yeah i'm better than everybody because well, i'm just so cognizant of the patriarchy and yeah. blah, blah blah meanwhile when it actually comes down to the, like the real issues and the real things that are affecting they they're fucking silent <laughs> i i would agree i would agree i think that politics always have played a place in my life i get really emotional about certain things like i i like i want a real rant about like guns and stuff i don't believe in that but what i mean besides that it's like i don't like when i come to like when i came to that place it was to forget about all that bullshit that was happening it's like let's go into a world where like that shit's like that shit doesn't matter it's like it, and like yeah it does get it does get a little messed up when someone does kind of bring it into play and and you know someone does make it an inappropriate joke and it gets uncomfortable then yeah then then it does matter and it has to be addressed a little bit but to say that to say that an all male cast is gonna is gonna bring those things more out there and more outward i i don't know i don't i don't it's believe like, that like, i think oh, it's, it's not a safe climate to have a male it, cast uh, but with that said so say it's say it's a man and a woman on stage isn't that dangerous too what if the man says something inappropriate yeah to what the if woman? he says something like, sexist i've said yeah no no but really i mean like i've seen i've seen that more than i've seen usually when i see guys all guys they're burying a dead body they're do, or they're going yeah. on an adventure or it's father and son it's never like this 
bro out fratty thing. Yeah, it's like, not. I don't. Especially because, never... dude, the improvisers who are yeah. in Second City are not like fratty people. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I, I don't get that. I don't get that. But um, if it, if it's a rule that they think, if they're gonna do, if they're gonna, if they make it temporary and they think that it it's the best way of getting just better humor i get it but at the same time i don't think that's true so, I, th- I think yeah. it's wrong but yeah yeah this uh, uh we're, we're already at an hour and a half yeah. here so. jesus I, I i i was like are we at two hours no oh, no okay. it always has the one and then okay it, when you see another number on top of it it means then you know, add oh, okay, to right on. Well, dude, oh man, I man. can I can still talk, but honestly, right? yeah, Sa- same I know, here. I know, but I know, people are fatigue, <laughs> right? Are getting pissed off. So yeah, <laughs> but yeah, no, thanks, Max. I, I really appreciated having you on, and uh, I want people to check out the Max and Tony show. You can find it on iTunes. I'll link it in the description of this yeah. podcast, and uh, check out Patriot, man. Check oh, it out. Please check out Patriot. And uh, if you're interested in, uh, I'll just say this again. If you're interested in the classes that made me me, you know, uh, Vagabond School, on camera classes, uh, The Annoyance, and Second City. I went to Columbia College. Just don't be an all male class, yeah. you know. <laughs> just, yeah, just don't do that, you know. But um, well, chop off your you balls, know. guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, man. something like that. But you know, just uh, thank you, Kevin. Man, this was this was a great conversation, and uh, I, but you know, it, if we could do a part two, or if you could come on the Max and Tony show one of these days, hell uh, yeah, you know, I'm definitely do down. Awesome. All right, sounds good. See you later, people.